Well, we haven't started a vlog by turning on the sign in a while. Let's do that. So what's up, you two? Today we are doing a classic Hollywood vlog. We are, uh, we are gonna investigate the crime, the death, the murder of William Desmond Taylor, a famous actor, director, who was killed in 1922, and yet no one has ever been tried for the murder. Days with Jordan the Lion, and these two begin now. And I guess we'll let this guy be a part of things too. Now the William Desmond Taylor case is kind of a weird one because there are a lot of questions that we you know, have to examine in this. One being, why did anyone kill him? Who killed him? And how did they kill him? It's, it's a very weird, bizarre story. And uh, in the end, there's a very popular belief uh, by an investigation that King Vidor did as to one person who did the murder but then someone else on their deathbed confessed to it. And who would kill a man that has no enemies? And then there has to be the question, why was there never an investigation? Why was there never anyone charged? Why, why do we never have an official answer to this story? We have a lot of questions to answer and talk about today. And why was one of the most famous actresses in the world having dinner with him the night he died, literally five minutes before he was killed? And one interesting little twist to the case is that William had two secrets he was hiding. Now secret one was that he wasn't actually William Desmond Taylor at all. He had a whole different life before he ever moved out to Hollywood, and his name was actually William Dean Tanner. Secret two, they found out after his death that he was living a double life, that he was actually um, homosexual, and um, so when he died, before even the police came, his butler called Paramount. Paramount sent their people in to start uh, distracting evidence putting in different things to help muddy up the investigation, help hide this secret life that William Desmond Taylor had been living. And it's not what you're thinking. William Desmond Taylor wasn't killed by a uh, jealous boyfriend or anything like that. Not that kind of Hollywood story. In the end, the person they believed to have killed William Desmond Taylor, or at least King Vitor did, actually did it out of jealousy all right, but it was jealousy out of being in love with the same man that her daughter was in love with. And though that is a reason, that's probably not even the most specific reason. The reason she was believed to have been the murderer is because her daughter was Mary Miles Minter, famous actress in the day, making millions of dollars, and in the contract for Mary's contract with the studio, Everything went through her mother, Charlotte Shelby. And Charlotte vowed in public to people, no one will ever take my daughter from me or I'll kill him. Basically saying that Mary was never allowed to fall in love. And unfortunate for Mary, she fell in love with William Desmond Taylor, a man who didn't seem to share her love in return. Or at least not with marriage. Um, they were implicated together, they were, they were seen together, they had dinners together, and in fact, people said that they saw in public that Mary was so desperate for his affections that she would literally strip down to nothing and beg him to have sex with her and he still would not do it. Many believe the reason for this was because, you know, some believed he was actually in love with Mabel Norman and had proposed marriage to Mabel Norman several times and Mabel just couldn't commit so he was kind of holding out hope for her. Mabel Norman is who he was having dinner with the night he was murdered. So as you might have guessed, 
One of our first suspects is famous Mabel Norman. Now Mabel and William were best friends and so she had no motive to do this. In fact, he did nothing but help her in life. Um, she was kind of part of the party scene and was supposedly addicted to cocaine and he was an avid um, protector of her. So much so that he would go out and threaten the drug dealers that were selling her drugs. So she was eventually ruled out because she really had no motive. But someone who did have a motive was William Desmond Taylor's former valet who, while William was on uh, holiday in Europe, stole some of his checks and um, forged thousands of dollars worth of checks, stole many of his personal belongings and jewelry and then, and his car, and uh, took off up to Northern California never to be seen again. Now, William Desmond Taylor did try and prosecute him, but they couldn't find him and uh, eventually William Desmond Taylor would receive in the mail uh, pawn slips signed out with the name Dean Tanner and so he knew that's who had stolen his items. He had proof because that was one of the few people who knew his former identity of William Dean Tanner. And six weeks after the murder was committed, his valet committed suicide. Now I want to go over and visit his grave. Probably guess where we are now. Well, here he is. If you didn't know what you were looking for, you could walk right past him. But there he is, memorialized in memory of William C. Dean Tanner, beloved father of Ethel D. Dean Tanner, died February 1st, 1922. Now the story behind why he changed his name was not for professional reasons necessarily, or maybe it was, but what he was kind of being blackmailed with uh, by his valet was that when William came from Ireland, he first settled in New York City, met a woman, got married, had a child, and then supposedly in 1908 he had second thoughts and decided to take off and join theater going across the country. So maybe that's the one bad thing that you can attribute to Mr. William Desmond Taylor, um, you know, but now he had taken on a new name perhaps even a new persona because like I said, nobody really had anything negative to say about him. Now, one of the hitches or maybe one of the things that happened along the way is that I told you early on there was a woman who on her deathbed, hours before she died, she claimed to have killed him. Now, her name was Patricia Palmer and apparently their history went all the way back to um, 1910 when they were doing theater together in Denver and they worked very closely she developed an infatuation with him or a love for him and uh, and then when they both ended up in Hollywood they would end up making movies together and apparently you know one of the theories is that um you know she just never quit caring about him quit loving him sounds like everybody that met this guy ended up falling in love with him but uh yeah, she claimed on her deathbed that she was the one who murdered him. Now, by most accounts, they say that uh, William Desmond Taylor just like routinely rejected Mary Miles Minter. And what she was looking for was, um, apparently he was just, you know, he was known as like this gentleman director that um, was very dashing, debonair, and strong. and. She was trying to not only one escape her mother, um, you know, which she said that she, you know, her mother said that she would never allow her to fall in love or get married or anything, but she also liked the fact that you know he had a um, flourishing career when hers wasn't really. Even though she had that big deal, a lot of people said she wasn't really that great of an actress, and um, yeah, so they said that she was looking, you know, basically at first to get him to make love to her. 
And then it was also, you know, to get him to marry her as well. Now, most of the accounts are that he just didn't have any interest, but um, she, Mary Miles Minter did an interview in 1970 where she said that um, the day of, well, the day after the murder when they found his body on the second, she actually went over um, a few blocks from where she lived to Mabel Norman's house. And when she went there, she said, there were a ton of police officers there and they didn't want to let her in. But when Mabel saw her, she invited her in and they talked. And um, Mabel said that, you know, Mary, he always loved you. He was just scared of how much he loved you. Now in that interview, uh, Mary Miles Minter said that she never believed that Mabel had anything to do with the murder. She said they were just so close friends and she said, and to be honest, she said that um, Mabel Norman was one of the only people that was nice to everyone and really had no bad blood with anyone. Now one of the crazy instances that was, um, that's been uh, accounted in many books is that one of the times that um, uh, Charlotte Shelby, who was Mary Miles Minter's mother, uh, believed that the two were hooking up, um, she threatened Mary and threatened to kill William and threatened to lock Mary in a room. So Mary grabbed the family gun, which I believe was a 38, and ran up into her room and said she was gonna end it all, lock the door, actually she went into her mother's room, locked the door, and started firing off shots to make them think that she had committed suicide. Now. That gun was never found after the murder. However, those, some of the bullets from the gun were found in the Minter home many years later. And when they were tested, they were from the exact same, or they were the same, exact same make and everything as the one that killed William Desmond Taylor. Now, even though the apartment building is gone, I think we should go over to the scene of the murder. Right here where this Ross parking lot is now in 1922 on February 1st is where this murder took place. Now basically what the theory is as to what transpired that night was that Mabel Norman came over at about 7 o'clock and uh, she had dinner with William Desmond Taylor um, and then about 7.45 um, she her butler, her driver was out here out front, parked, waiting for her. She got in the car and within like five minutes of leaving, someone else came in and killed William Desmond Taylor. Now here's the, um, here's what makes it kind of crazy and kind of hard to figure out was that the, uh, the gunshot, some of the early speculation was that it was, you know, this ex-valet of his who was kind of they thought maybe blackmailing him. Then some thought it was Mabel Norman. But um, what was weird about it was they also thought that it might be the drug dealers that William Desmond Taylor was trying to get rid of. Like I mentioned earlier, he was apparently like physically confronting people to get rid of them. And um, so he, uh, some people believed it was those people that had come to uh, come to kill him. But when where he was shot his arms were extended up as though he was either embracing someone or someone that he knew. So let's go a little closer and I'll tell you more of the story. Now the way that the gunshot went in, it went into a little above his waist, in between the armpit and the waist, and it was angled upward and went basically from that middle section, angled up through into his back. So after that shot happened, his next door neighbor uh, looked out her screen door and she said saw a figure that appeared to be a man um, in like kind of a big overcoat with like a big collar up and a hat covering his face and whatever and she said that when she saw him he didn't act um, nervous or scared or anything like that like maybe what a hired killer would said that um, the person actually kind of leaned back in as though they were saying good night and so when they uh, the next day when his new valet came to the house to start making breakfast, he noticed the lights were on and found Mr. Uh, Taylor's body laying on the ground dead. Now, instead of calling the police first, he actually called the studio and they came and started removing things, planting things. Um, one of the things they said that they planted was Mary Miles Minter's, um, kind of some of her um, negligee, um, undergarment kind of things. 
because they were trying to kind of cover up or kind of like murky up some of the details of um, his alternate lifestyle, as they said. But one of the things that they um, said also was that they theorized that it could have been uh, Mary or her mother. Now, they actually had a friend who was a uh, bit actor, and he vouched that he was at home with them, with them both uh, that night, and that it couldn't have been them, and he inexplicably received $200 a month for the rest of his life um, from Mary's mother, who, like I said, controlled Mary's finances. Now, it was said that part of the reason that they never really did much of an investigation on this was because um, Mary's mom, um, basically what they believed, started to speculate, and this was all King Vidor, the director. He, um, tw 45 years actually after the murder, he decided he wanted to make a, a movie about this and then um, did all the investigating and actually figured out who did it, but because so many of the people that were implicated were still alive, he decided to just bury it. And so it wasn't until a biographer of his was going through some of his documents and said that King Vidor actually kept everything from like uh, ticket stubs, theatrical receipts, postcards, letters, I mean, you name it, he had it. And when the guy was doing the investigating, he said, I couldn't find anything from 1967. He couldn't find any of the information there, so he said he started digging through all of King Vidor's houses, um, you know, pulling up uh, floorboards, looking everywhere, and finally in a guest house underneath a hot water heater, he found the box and said that in there, King Vidor had figured out that it was actually Mary's mother and that what had happened or what he believed happened was that um, the night that it happened, Mary's mother was also in love with William Desmond Taylor. And, um, and so it was part that she was jealous, plus part didn't want to lose her daughter, that she found out um, or she believed that she overheard over the phone that Mary and um, William were going to elope. And so she locked Mary in a room. Mary escaped the room and went to see William, apparently. But um, they said that that is what drove um, Charlotte Shelby to come here and to commit the murder. Now they said that um, whenever the police would try and investigate this, for one thing, everything had been kind of like muddied up with all the people in there going through things and, um, and kind of like um, toxifying the evidence. But also, he said main, the main uh, reason was that the district attorney at the time kept um, removing officers from the case and just appeared to have no interest in it. Um, and they believe that, that Charlotte Shelby was paying off the DA at that time to make this case basically just go away. So there was never officially anyone charged, although there was always rumor that it was Charlotte that had done this. So in the 50s, Charlotte finally had enough of it and she demanded that they investigate her. And um, some of the documents are missing, but they said that during the testimony, Mary said no, that her mother didn't do it, that her mother was home with her. But she had an older sister that was also Charlotte's daughter that said and that uh, that her mother had done it and that her mother had had a um, housekeeper um, committed because she knew the truth and said that um, her mother was paying off the DA and everything and I guess they um, they kind of started after that exposing that that daughter had um, mental issues but you never know if that was just something they accused her of to make it go away um, but they did say that in 1957 Charlotte Shelby supposedly died um, but she didn't really die she faked her death and lived with Mary in Santa Monica in a house up in an attic for like the rest of her life. And the way that they know this is that one of the next door neighbors of the house said that he was friends with the family and said that after Mary died, he was going through the house and found letters from Charlotte's doctor in like 1960, three years after she was supposedly dead, saying, you know, why don't you just give this up and let people know you're alive? It'd be a lot easier on everyone else. And, and uh, they said basically that Charlotte was just basically worried that at some point it would come back to haunt her, so she'd just rather people think she was dead. So she waited out the rest of her days chain smoking cigarettes up in one attic room in a rocking chair. So maybe we never really will ever know what ended up happening, but there is a book out there on King Vidor's life, and I'll put the title right here. And he's the one who found the documents. He's the one that has come out and said that uh, King Vidor believed that it was uh, 
it was Charlotte Shelby that ended up killing him. But like I said, Patricia Palmer also said on her deathbed, um, she had apparently fallen in her house in her elder years and uh, summoned her next door neighbors to come help her. And when they did, I guess she kind of knew she was gonna die and told them, uh, you know, I used to be a, uh, a silent movie star in the tens and twenties and I killed a man named William Desmond Taylor. Now you gotta remember this was um, in the, gosh when was this, in the eighties I believe, so you didn't have the internet to just go look things like that up, but her neighbor that she told that to after she passed away, he went up into her attic and found a trunk um, with all these stills and everything, so he uh, spent five years investigating and figuring out you know, the life story of Patricia Palmer and her alias before even that and how that connection with William Desmond Taylor, all the movies they made together, and then their history back in Denver, he kind of pieced it all together. So maybe we never really will know who killed him, but everyone seems to believe that it was Charlotte Shelby. And in fact, one of the last kind of living people that was involved in the case was the last um, investigator with the police department, and he even said, he's like, there was an obvious, um, attempt by the DA for this to no, go no further than it did. And um, he said he firmly believed that Charlotte Shelby was involved in it, said that he knew that both mother and daughter were in love with him, and in the end he said he thought that Charlotte came to say one last goodbye, just accepting that, you know, that her daughter was gonna do this, but really came there with the intent of killing him and had that gun up her sleeve, and that that was probably her that looked like a man that, uh, walked out of the apartment with the big overcoat and everything else. In 1967, when King Veter interviewed Mary Miles Minter, he said that the last thing that she said to him when he walked away was, she hugged him and said, my mother killed anything I ever loved. And in the mid 60s, they got rid of this apartment that once stood here, the scene of the crime, and put up a parking lot that's now a Ross. It's so now this Ross. And this is what that street looks like today. His apartment building would have been right over here. Well, I always try and patronize the places that I vlog. And now, whenever I sit down to go to the bathroom, I'll always remember this vlog. $7.99, not a bad deal for a padded toilet seat. So from what I could see in old pictures, there was a building to the left of his building, and then his was in the center. Look what I walked into. Good grief. Hey, let's keep it PG. <laughs> Hi, bud. Hi. Well, it's a pretty sad story for both William Desmond Taylor and Mary Miles Minter. You know, she pursued him for years, literally throwing herself at him, and, uh, and every time her mother would threaten him with hairpins, threaten to stab him with hairpins, or threaten to shoot him with her gun or whatever, so even if there was a, uh, a budding relationship, it probably would have been halted by a lot of that, and it's unfortunate that both of those people ended up suffering in the end. My buddy's down there working on his treats. Look at that shiny coat. Well gang, that is it. That is my take on the William Desmond Taylor case. There are about a million different theories and that's the one that made the most sense to me when I put everything together from everything that I was able to find and read. That all made the most sense, so there you go. Thank you, Barbara Kaiser, for becoming my newest Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel, go to patreon.com slash jordanthelion and contribute a dollar a month. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great night, and goodbye. I mean, goodbye. Megatroid and Mega City, thinking that my world's so pretty, oh, oh, oh. Wants to be the general, but I play custard singing, so oh, oh.